Today we continue our One Another series, this time by looking at the instruction to serve. But I want to say right out the gate that today is not an attempt, this message is not an attempt to guilt trip you into serving, those of you who do not currently serve in the church. Today is not a volunteer drive to boost up our volunteer base, despite what the video might have made it seem like. Would I like to see more of you get involved in the life of the church in volunteer in ministries? Absolutely. I don't deny it. But that is not necessarily the goal of today's message. Rather, this morning, we will again be reflecting on who we are as brothers and sisters in Christ, how we are to relate to one another, and how we are to reflect him together, reflect Jesus together, his love, and his gospel message to the surrounding community. So how do we maintain healthy relationships with one another? I hear you ask. Well, what have we looked at so far in this series? We do so by first looking at, by first loving one another. Do you remember that a few weeks ago? Which is a choice to love one another, a choice to place others and their needs above us and our own for the glory of God. Next, by encouraging one another. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago. That is by using our words carefully to build others up. And then as we looked at last week, forgiving one another. That is to be merciful toward each other in the same way God through Christ has been merciful toward us. And so now this morning we look at the instruction to serve one another. But not in a kind of transactional type of way, but out of our love for Christ and out of our love for each other. Galatians 5, 13 to 14, after all, says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But what about that passage? that we had read out earlier to us from Matthew 25, with the sheep and the goats and their serving, or lack thereof serving, the king. Are these things found in this passage really expected of us? Serving through feeding and clothing and visiting strangers? What if we don't have the time? Did Jesus mean to say that we will, in fact, be judged by our works as opposed to our faith? And if so, shouldn't we get on with it and serve others, lest we be thrown into the fires of hell? These are the questions that can and do arise from this passage when we read it. And so they are the questions that we will be addressing this morning, as well as the question behind the question, what does it mean to serve one another? But before we go any further, would you pray with me? Father, indeed, I thank you for your word, and I thank you how it still continues to speak to us by your Holy Spirit today. And so, God, as we open up uh, and, and study this passage, I pray that you will be with us, that you will be with, with myself as I, as I lead this time. But, but God, I pray that you be with us, that we might be able to discern your voice in this. And God, I, I pray that you hide me behind your cross. These people have not come here to hear my wisdom, but have come here to hear from you. So God, I pray that you might speak and that we might have open and receptive hearts and minds. Be with us now, I pray, in your name. Amen. If you have your Bible with you this morning, please open it with me 
to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Now the passage that will form the basis uh, of this morning's message, starting at verse uh, 31, uh, comes at the end of a long discourse in Matthew's Gospel about the end times. Uh, If you flick back to the beginning of chapter 4, you will see how this discourse began after Jesus prophesied about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem an event that occurred in 70 AD, and a prophecy that formed the basis of the charges leveled at Jesus, albeit a a twisting of what he had actually said. What we then read, verse 3 of chapter 24, is that Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, and his disciples came to him privately, saying, tell us, when will these, these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus then answered them and shared the signs of his coming, including um, the, uh, the abomination of desolation as spoken by Daniel, followed by his actual coming as the Son of Man, verse 30, uh, 29 to 31, which will be at a time no one will know, verses 36 to 51, Then we have the lesson of the fig tree, verses 32 to 35. The parable of the ten virgins, chapter 25 now, verses 1 to 13. The parable of the talents, verses 14 to 30, both of which are about the readiness of God's people. And then we arrive at the final judgment, verse 31 of chapter 25. And a scene from the throne room itself where Jesus testifies to what humanity can expect when they finally stand before him. One, as one author puts it, it's, it's the superb climax of, of all that God's people have been waiting for, when God will put the world to rights and reward and judge according to his mercy and will. Now, it might seem a little odd that I've chosen this passage and this context to talk about serving one another. However, so what I have to say to that is stay with me. Stay with me on this, and hopefully it will all make sense soon. So here we are at verse 31 of Matthew 25. And straight away, the first thing we note is that this passage is not a parable. Unlike the two passages before it, which are parables, today's uh, passage is not introduced as one. Nor does it begin in the same way as many of of, uh, Jesus' parables begin, with, with a reference to what the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is like or will be like. The passage simply begins with, if this, uh, this might not work today, you might have to follow along with me, Craig. The passage simply begins with, when the Son of Man comes, here it is, in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. But that's exactly what he will do. Not something like sit on his throne. He will, in the end, come in his glory and claim the throne as his own. Most people confuse this passage with a parable, mostly because of the shepherd simile introduced in the next verse. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate from one another, the people from one another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Now, I'm no farmer, but I, they tell me that Palestinian sheep and goats, so sheep and goats from that part of the world, look the same from a distance. 
They can look the same. Apparently they did back then and they do today. Thanks to their grey goats, it often takes a second look before you can distinguish between the two. All right, so in the Middle East, sheep have grey goats, unlike what we have here, you know, the nice white fluffy goats that you can often spot a mile away. Over there, not so easy, apparently. Hold on to that one. Hold on to that one for a moment. Now, what comes next in this passage could be and has been interpreted many different ways. This morning, though, I, you may or may not be pleased to hear that I will not be unpacking each and every perspective. I will only be unpacking the interpretation that that I hold, the one that I have come to again after researching and meditating on this passage and on all of the perspectives. If you would like to have a theological discussion about this passage and about the other interpretations, come find me after the service. What I would like to point out now, though, is that it will be all the nations, all the people of the world, who will stand before Christ and his throne at the second coming, which is what is depicted here in this passage. Verse 32, Before him will be gathered all the nations, all the people, Not just the Christians, and not with the exception of them either, but all the people, those in Christ and those not of him, together in one place. But then what happens? Verse 33. They are split, and a large number number of them go to his right, culturally a a place that symbolics favour, and a large number will go to his left, symbolising disfavor. The question then is, what distinguishes them? What distinguishes them? Is it their deeds, as a plain reading of the text would suggest? Or is it something else? Last week we studied what I said was perhaps the most contentious exhortations of them all, of all the one another passages. The one that says we are to forgive each other. We looked at the confronting parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18 and considered the conclusion of Jesus found in verse 35. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you, that is deliver you to the torturers, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. We talked about the mercy uh, that God through Christ has lavished upon us and how we are expected to selflessly give that same kind of mercy to our brothers and sisters despite their sin and failings. We also wrestled with the truth that by refusing to give forgiveness to another, it is one in the same as refusing to receive forgiveness from God and the free gift of salvation therein. However, as we acknowledge, there is a difference between refusing to forgive and struggling to forgive. And we looked at how we ought to and are able to hand over our hurt pain and frustration to God and forgive in the same way that we each have been forgiven. This of all is, of course, based on love, again, as we looked at. In fact, we began this whole series looking at Jesus' command in John 13 to what? Love one another. Very good. You still with me? Love one another. Verse 13, uh, sorry, Matthew, John 13, 34 to 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. 
Now, as I said at the time, and, and as I brought up again last week, that last bit in verse 35, by, by all this people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another, that last bit is often understated as a simple throwaway line of Jesus, meaning that if we love one another, we make it easier for the world to identify us as Christians, like, like putting a badge on us or a sticker with Christian written on it. Now, as true as that is, it is not the whole truth. When you bring into account other passages, as we did, including from 1 John 3 and 4, this passage receives a different perspective. It can be better understood as saying, by loving one another, we prove to be his disciples, and everyone will know it. The simple matter of the fact is, church, that those who have been born of God, who is love, who know God, who is love, and who have God, who is love, abiding in them, should not be able to help themselves but love all those around them. Do you remember that from last week, from last month? All right, you've got to go back and listen to it then. Loving God will result in loving and forgiving one another. You can't get around it. And by loving and forgiving one another, we prove to be his disciples. And everyone will know it. So why do I, why do I bring this all up? Because some theologians and pastors like to interpret what comes next in our passage this morning, in Matthew 25, as saying that Christians secure their salvation by their works. That faith is not alone. Sorry, that faith alone is not enough. It's not sufficient. That works are required. And that we will never know if we are saved until we stand before Christ and he judges whether or not we belong with the sheep or with the goats. However, you might be glad to hear, I disagree with that. I'm with a school of thought that interprets these verses to say that Christians do not secure their salvation by their works, but by their works they prove whether or not they are in salvation. I'll repeat that. Christians do not secure their salvation by their works. But by their works, they prove whether or not they are in salvation. Stay with me here and turn with to verse 34 of Matthew 25. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Church, the understanding, the key to understanding, rather, this passage is in the question of the righteous, beginning verse 37. Lord, when did we see you? The righteous did not realize that by serving the least of these, my brothers, which simply means to serve followers of Christ, they were in fact... Serving him. 
In other words, they did not serve one another in order to secure their salvation because their faith wasn't enough. No. They served one another because that's what the righteous do. Because that's what people do who have been made right by the blood of Christ and blessed by the Father. They serve. They serve the hungry. They serve the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, those in prison. Because that's what Christ did, and that's what they want to do too. Not to save themselves. Not out of guilt or obligation. But out of love, gratitude and worship, they serve one another. The surprise uh, in their question, back to the king, Lord, when did we see you, says it all. They were not serving to receive. They were serving out of love. Church, by loving one another, we prove to be his disciples. By forgiving each other, we prove that we are children of God. By serving one another, we prove that we belong among the righteous. D.A. Carson, a famous theologian, once said this, The good works performed by the sheep are not performed by the goats, though clearly related to the ultimate destiny of each group, are not stated to be the cause of that destiny. Rather, such good works are the evidence of those of uh, the evidence of who those people really are. True disciples will pass an examination not because they are trying to pass an examination, but because they will love his brother and sisters and therefore Jesus. An RVG tasker. By the very spontaneousity, I'm getting that wrong, and unselfconsciousness of their love, by their unaffected goodness and their perseverance in well doing, they have proved themselves true sons of their heavenly Father. So what about the goats? Well, they acted in the complete opposite manner as the sheep. They too asked, Lord, when did we see you? Verse 34. When did we get the chance to minister to you? To which Jesus responded, verse 45, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. In other words, they did not love the Lord their God with all their heart and with all their soul and with all their strength and with all their mind and therefore did not love their neighbour as themselves. They rejected God and his commands and as a result, verse 46, they will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. Galatians 5, 13 to 14. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. We've been called to love one another. And one way of showing our love for one another is by serving one another. And by serving each other, we serve our king together. 
So how do we serve one another and our king together? Well, that's for you to discover. Yes, we can get an idea of what serving each other looks like by looking at this passage, but but this passage is not the be-all and end-all. This list in Matthew 25, that is the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, those in prison, it's not exhaustive. For example, have you ever noticed that widows and orphans don't make the list in Matthew 25? Does that mean that we don't have to look out for them and love them and serve them? No. There are many passages in the Scriptures that that tell us that where where God's people have been charged with their care. Just because it's not mentioned in our passage today doesn't mean they no longer matter. Rather, the list in Matthew 25 paints a portrait of vulnerable persons. Vulnerable people who are brothers and sisters in Christ. Vulnerable people like you and like me at times. Now again, it doesn't mean that by highlighting the need of the least of these, my brothers, uh, means that we ignore non-believers. What Jesus says in Luke 6 about loving and blessing and doing good to our enemies should all about blast that kind of thinking out of the water. Yes, though only disciples are mentioned in our passage this morning, it does not mean we should not lift our gaze. On the contrary, we have been committed, we have been commanded to, to love in action, to love one another as the most, which is the most powerful witness of all. So how do we serve one another and therefore our king together? Well, that's for you to discover. Find out. Find out how you can serve. Find out where you can serve. Think about your talents and how God has gifted you. Pray that God might show you where to go. It might not be the most glamorous role, but just remember that in the end you are, in fact, serving the king. So find out. Look around. Adjust your schedule and serve your brothers and your sisters. And in case you're wondering, I'm not just talking about serving at church, right? serving on a Sunday morning or at, during, in one of our ministries during the week. No, you can serve the king outside of these walls too. However, there are many areas where you could serve within these walls as well. So find out. Ask, look around and ask people who are serving. Think about your talents and your gifts that God has gifted you with. Keep your eyes and heart open to the vulnerable. Pray that God might show you where you can serve him. And with gratitude, show your love to your fellow brother or sister. But do I really have to? I heard someone ask. Do we really have to serve one another? Well, the question should not be whether or not you have to, but whether or not you want to. An unwillingness to serve is like an unwillingness to love and an unwillingness to forgive. Perhaps it shows you where your heart is before God. So I encourage you to reflect on him this morning and on his love and on his forgiveness and the service that he has shown you and given to you. As I said earlier, hold on to the fact that thanks to their grey coats, Palestinian sheep... Middle Eastern sheep and goats look the same. It often takes a second look before you can distinguish between the two. 
Well, my prayer for us is quite simply that I pray that that's not true for us. I hope no one needs to take a second look at us as a church. Rather, that it is obvious to all those around who we are, who we worship, and why we selflessly serve. I pray that we portray the love of Christ in all that we do. Now, this is going to test your memory. If we're going to be a people who proclaim hope, then we what? We've got to be a people of hope, a people with healthy relationships with God and others. And one of the ways we can build healthy relationships and show our love for one another is by serving one another. I pray that we will be a church that puts the needs of others above ourselves, a church that is willing to roll up their sleeves and get involved and a church that is reflecting the love, forgiveness, and works of God to one another and the surrounding community. Amen? Would you pray with me? Father, I again just thank you for your word and God I thank you for your Holy Spirit who is here with us now ministering to our hearts and to our souls and God I just want to first and and, and foremost again just just thank you for all that you have done for us the service that you have shown us the the love the forgiveness that you have shown us and God as we have just now reflected on how we are commanded to go and do likewise. God, that you help us do just that. That you help us to love each other, that you help us to forgive one another, to to encourage each other. And God, that you help us to serve one another in the same way that we, through the testimony of your scriptures, witness Jesus serve others in order to show the glory of God. So God, we just pray that as we go out of here this morning, that we will have opportunities to serve one another, to serve those within the church family, outside, as many have already been doing these past couple of weeks, which have been just marvelous. God, I pray that you help us to go and continue to do that. And we just pray that through our works, the love of Christ might shine. We pray that through our words, sharing your gospel message, that God, other hearts and minds will shine, reflecting your glory, having received and welcomed you into their lives. This we pray in your name. Amen.